Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for August 18th, 2020. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, here in the Starfall Graphics Studios in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I'm speaking <laughs> with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly, which we put on every week to talk about all things organized. Uh, we're super glad that you joined us today. We cover all things organized and we get those topic suggestions from you from you going to our channels and making all the lovely comments that you make that I struggle to keep up with answering so we <laughs> appreciate that you do it and um, I'm so grateful that you guys have so many things to tell me about it's awesome. I see some new names in the list of participants on Zoom today so if you're joining us in Zoom for the first time share your comments and questions via the chat and I'll try and make sure Gail gets to them before we move on. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question yourself via audio or video and I can, I can unmute you and let your video show if you are willing. We're also streaming the webcast live on Facebook and you can share your questions and comments there and I'll relay them. And during the webcast every Tuesday you can talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833. Use meeting ID 993-419-863 to join the meeting. We're going to start today with a question from a YouTube viewer. Genevieve on YouTube shared a bunch of great topic suggestions for us and we're going to hit we're going to hit some of those in the coming months. We're going to start with one today though. Genevieve asked Gail what were the hardest and easiest organizing jobs you've undertaken? The hardest job was a, uh, is an easy answer because it was a hoarding job. And let me just preface this with, um, I can't give you too many specific details because I'm maintaining the person's privacy. I will say that this particular person has passed away and um, doesn't have family. And so I don't think I'm busting anybody's privacy by sharing the details that I will. Um, that particular job, um, she called me from the rehab hospital because she was being treated for something and in her leg, I forget exactly, that affected her mobility. And they did not want to release her from the hospital until she could get into her apartment with a walker. And it was a one little one bedroom apartment, about 700 square feet. And <clears throat> she called me to say, I need you to make a path so that I can get in so that they will let me come home. And so I got, I went and met her at rehab and got the keys and went to this house and I brought two people with me so that we could survey it. And uh, when I got there to unlock the door, one of the neighbors popped out and said, oh, I just want to watch to see your reaction when you open the front door. <laughs> And that should have been my clue that it was going to be really dense. And it was very, very dense. And there was literally a path that was a goat trail that was already a foot off the floor um, with collected stuff and trash and whatever. And we sort of had to walk into the room single file. And then we had to turn around and walk out in the same order. Like we couldn't pass each other in the apartment. It was very dense. So we took the job on, but I never went alone. I always took people with me. We threw out about 450 bags of trash and that required filling the trash bag and then loading it into a bucket that we put on a dolly. And then we had to dolly it up across the apartment complex to throw it in the dumpster. And we found things like there was an infestation of mice, first of all, that we didn't know about when we started. Um, we went to move a few things and then mice went. Pshh. They had, uh, it had been a quiet apartment. She had been in um, uh, the hospital and rehab for a long time. And so they had just moved in because there was food in the apartment because she had been shopping and bringing bags of food in and she couldn't actually get into the kitchen. So they would just sort of end up sitting on the top. So we would find things like in a grocery bag, we'd find an Oreo cookie container that had a little bitty hole in the end and not a speck of crumb in the entire container. Like they had chewed into the container, gotten in, eaten every bit of cookie, and then left again, <laughs> left the shell of the container. It was like somebody had transported the contents out on Star Trek out of the container and left it empty. Um, so the mice were a challenge. The uh, bugs were a challenge. The 
did food was a challenge and uh, in particular one day when i wasn't present um i had um three helpers who went one day when i couldn't be there i had a different client to do and they were clearing an area that was sort of back towards the dining room on the way to the kitchen and they touched a bag that apparently had a dozen eggs and a carton in it and one of, they had been there for some time and one of the eggs exploded and apparently set out an odor that they still describe to this day as curling the hair in their nose <laughs> it was just a really very very bad and they all had to run out and then it was really hard to work in there for a while and once they realized what had happened then they had to go back and grab the egg carton bag and get it into a trash bag and get it out of the apartment and in the moving of it again they broke a couple of a few more exploded and so they really got toast bad 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 and so <clears throat> that particular clean out was it had sort of all the hallmarks of there's rodents and there was insects and there was dead food and there was a really dense environment and so it was a lot a lot of labor and um, while I considered it a professional challenge to do it, and, and we did get through the living room and the kitchen and the dining room and into the bathroom and then on our way into the bedroom before she actually uh, passed away. So we didn't get to complete the job, but it was a very interesting experience of it can really get that dense and it can really get that interesting to clear out <laughs> i would say <laughs> that was the hardest job to work with and um, and there are lots of people that like to do hoarder work and they come in with a team and a whole bunch of hazmat equipment and a whole bunch of crew and um you know people that were better trained at hoarding work probably would have been fine with it and run run and gone and made it happen um it was a it was a learning experience for me and i think i learned that a really um, level five hoarding situation is probably not my ideal client, <laughs> but it was, uh, I was happy to face the challenge and try. And uh, I have never been so grateful that I wasn't present for the egg explosion. <laughs> I will always be grateful that I missed the egg explosion. That's what I'm gonna say about that one. And then um, I think the easiest jobs really are not one in particular, but the easiest jobs for me are when the <clears throat> when the client is really prepared and wants to be involved in the process. And so they are absolutely engaged and ready to jump in and work with me. Invested. And yeah, yeah, yeah. When they're really invested in the process and getting an outcome, they have a vision for an outcome that they want and they have a target in mind and they're trying to make a change and they're ready to make a change. And those people uh, make the job really pleasant and easy for me because then we're both, um, you know, sort of pulling, pulling the boat in the same direction and, and it makes it a lot more uh, fun for me. And um, I think that those people that are ready to make a change and are comfortable with the idea, well, or they're willing to face the idea of looking at the stuff and having help and going yeah. through the process of divesting, um, even if it's scary to them or unnerving, they're willing to face the challenge. It, it's a lot of fun for both of us that way. Having observed you doing it for going on 14 years, mm -hmm. I know that the people who are committed to the outcome make the best clients. Right. Well, they the want the improvement fun. for themselves, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Let's, let's get on to our main topic, our feature topic for today, which is books and magazines. Serious readers sometimes collect books faster than they can read them. I collect books about three times as fast as I read, I think. <laughs> books are enchanting and never seem to lose their value, but buying more books than you can ever read is not that different from accumulating any other kind of clutter. And so we're going to talk today about getting the buying impulse into line with how much you actually read. 
and what to do after you've read all those wonderful books. Right, all those wonderful books. The thing about accumulating, buying books faster than you can read is that you are sort of building a collection and it does grow and get overwhelming and difficult to manage just like any other collection. You still end up surrendering living space to store the books that you have. Both of my parents were, were and are avid readers. My mother used to be, and my dad is still a big reader. And I caught the bug from them many years ago. <laughs> I have a small collection of books, and I read every night. Um, that said, I've also learned to keep the collection to a minimum because there's always more books to buy, and I can only devote so much time to reading. Buying everything that looks interesting guarantees I'll never read it at all. For anyone who loves books, they require strategies to keep them from becoming a huge source of clutter and overwhelm. So let's talk about some ways to cope with all those books and manage your love of reading. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the sh process of shopping for books. Browsing a bookstore is one of life's little pleasures. Not that we're doing a whole lot of browsing in stores right now, but generally they are a lot of fun. So it's really fun to slowly wind your way through the stacks and be looking at all the books and discovering something new around every corner. Here's a way, ha, here's a way to enjoy that trip without grabbing everything you see that looks interesting. Why not make a list instead as you walk? So keep a book list and as you shop, write down your favorites on a list. When you actually run out of something to read, you can consult the list for the next thing to buy. Instead of buying them all now, shop by writing them on the list as you go. When friends want to know what you want for your birthday or Christmas or an anniversary, consult your list and tell them exactly what you want. How great to order up exactly the gift you want and they can do it without wondering whether you're going to like it and you end up with something you actually want. It's a lot easier to store that list than all those books. And that way, anything that captures your fancy can go on the list and it can be the secondary step between I, it caught my fancy, so I put it on the list, but it hasn't actually come home with me yet. And then you can see if you ever actually put, bring it to the top of the list to buy it when it becomes time to go shopping for a new book. There's also shopping alternatives instead of wandering inside bookstores, and I'm sure that lots of people are trying to do that at the moment because your local bookstore may not be open right now or there's a whole lot of um, uh, distress about being wandering around shopping zone with a bunch of other people. So there are several newsletters that email out offers for eBooks with discounted prices. So one is early bird books with free eBooks from the public domain. And then they also offer discounted books. Ed, can you talk about your new book newsletters that you get? Yeah, I, I get a couple there and there are a bunch of them. I, there are some that I've unsubscribed from because they're kind of not, they don't have, they don't focus on the kinds of things I'm interested in, but uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of newsletters for specific genres, you know, mystery readers, people who, people who like to read romance, Western, those kinds of things. Biographies, I bet. Yeah. Biographies. Yeah. Um, uh, my latest favorite is Early Bird, which you mentioned. Early Bird sends a newsletter every single day. And the good thing about that one is the, the uh, discount links are only good for that day. So oh. if, I don't, if I don't get around to reading it, I know I can just throw it away, forget about it. <laughs> so they don't, the, news, the emails don't pile up, which is nice. But they, every day they will send a list of maybe half a dozen books, or, you know, three to six books, in the 99 cent to 299 you know price for ebooks and it's then low cost right like not yeah, which is it's, it's not eight or 12 or 15 bucks it's still cheap yeah and um and then another one and actually april mentioned this as well um bookbub i mm -hmm. also subscribe to bookbub bookbub is every day and a little overwhelming they're sometimes 20 or more titles in the newsletter per day which is a little bit much, but they also have a lot of free options. The free stuff is usually new, you know, authors you've never heard of who are trying to build an audience by offering a, an ebook for free. And it's very hit or miss. I've, I've gotten some of those that were terrible. 
and some of right. them that were not so terrible. But they, but they were free, right? So. Yeah. But but also early bird. If you're you know if you're an avid reader and you want to read really widely, the early bird newsletter typically has something free from the public domain. These are recent, like recently digitized versions of old books. Like today, there was a G.K. Chesterton book from, you know, early 20th century available for free. So lots of, you know, lots of stuff. You might get some classics that way too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and that's not something that I have ever done, but if you are a big reader and you like to be reading books and reading about books and finding out what's new and, and browsing through old and you don't feel comfortable going into a store right now, <laughs> this is a perfect way. And I'm sure that, you know, then you're sort of uh, trusting to the book gods to see what shows up in the newsletter as suggestions for you to look at. And so, um, and, and it, and if you only want to read mysteries, then you can get on a mystery list and et cetera, et cetera. So you can uh, try to get some electronic suggestions that way and then have access to ebooks in your genre and let it be a way for you to enjoy the browsing part and also not be necessarily buying physical books. So let's talk about the buying part. If none of us had to work, we could read all day long, <laughs> and I've done that on some of my days off, no doubt about it. Um, it's the ultimate leisure activity. Um, most of us can't read for endless amounts of time, though, and stocking more books than you can possibly read in a year, much less in your lifetime, means only one thing, that you're surrendering living space to books forever. So the lesson here is this. There's no point in building a collection that will never get read. It's a waste of your money and your space. So figure out how much time you can read a week, multiply that by 52 weeks, and that estimates how many books you can buy in a year. So let me do the math for you. If I'm generous, I can read 50 pages a night. So like I can, you know, read an hour before I go to bed at night. I got too much else going on during the day. I can't read really during the business day. And then when I come home at night, I'm having dinner and then I'm doing administrative tasks about the work. And so I have a small business. I'm self-employed, so <laughs> I don't have a lot of time to read, but I do like to read every night. So let's say I read 50 pages a night. That's 350 pages a week, and that's an average book, le a book length. So maybe I'm reading a book a week. So if I'm reading 52 books a year total, then there's no point in buying more than one a week or four a month because that's all I can read. You can use, that's sort of my, based on how much I read, how much time I have to read, that's the algorithm that I can use to decide. Mm. Basically, I can't have more than four books a month because um, they're not going to get read otherwise. And I do the same process. I mean, I only buy when I finish, because um, I read ebooks now mostly, and so I only buy a new ebook when I finish the next, the old one. <laughs> and so I don't buy a whole bunch in advance because I can't read them anyway. Every once in a while there'll be a sale and I'll buy a whole bunch of them. And then I keep having to go back to what I bought to read my way through what I just paid for. So I did that recently and I have, you know, 10 in the queue. And so now I'm not going to be buying anything into for a couple months until those 10 books are used up. So there's a whole bunch of, alternatives to filling your shelves of books aside from the ebook option the library is the most obvious one and now most libraries have digitized their catalogs so you can still get the physical book but you can shop it digitally many libraries participate in regional interlibrary loan networks as well so that means you have access to many libraries physical books and it's more convenient than ever to borrow even something that's very obscure from throughout your regional area. Libraries are often seen as a resource for children, but it's a free resource for anybody that likes to read. You can have a physical book to read and it never becomes clutter because you have to turn it back in. <laughs> it's the perfect way to see if you really want that book in your collection or not by trying it out first from the library. And if you're just running your way through romance novels or you're trying to get the next version of the next mystery series and you're trying to go back and start at the beginning and work your way forward, the library is the perfect place to do that. 
you can either order it online for pickup of the physical book or you can um, borrow their ebook version of it. So if they have ebooks for loan, then you can borrow that digital copy and still not have the physical book ever. Uh, when Ed moved out of his house all those years ago, he got rid of almost 2,500 books. After such a big dump, he needed a way to prevent himself from rebuilding such a big stash of physical books in the house. And we've talked before about how Ed resists the urge to buy a copy of every new book that grabs his attention. Ed, why don't you talk to us about the thought process you go through when you want to get your hands on more books? I will. And I want to also get to a couple of comments. A viewer in Zoom asked how to decide which books to get rid of if you have an attachment to books, but, but n might not look at them again. And that's the algorithms we've talked about before, you, you, of course, you have to define this for yourself, but you, you decide, you know, I'm going to, you have to set down some rules for yourself and say, I'm going to go through all my books and I'm going to only keep the ones that fit certain criteria. I, I bought it recently. I still feel actively interested in it. Um, I uh, can see myself reading it in the next year or whatever your cutoff is um mm -hmm. or or you know you can have some special cases um someone mentioned someone in the comments also mentioned antiquarian collections of books antique books first editions family heirlooms books you, you know kids books that you grew up with you can kind of create special rules that apply to those but they'll that'll be a small collection and it and the rules around that, you know, having an algorithm for things that you consider to be antique or family keepsakes or collectible books is a different set of criteria than the rest of your library, which is books that you're reading for your own entertainment and education. Yeah, and um, stuff you've and been so, pick, picking up in the bookstores, the yeah. the airport, the uh, right? the the yeah. sale the sale racks, and so on. Yeah. So my rule, you know, I just sort of decided I you know to do not did not want to build up a library again because it's a lot of trouble to move them it's a lot of trouble to dust them and, and store them and I also had some some vision issues I had had surgeries to both eyes over a course of several years that have made it harder for me to read books on paper than it than it used to be. I need very bright light and kind of large type. And so that sort of gave ebooks a little bit of an advantage. So my own process now is when I hear about a book that is interesting to me, the first thing I check is the libraries that offer ebook ebook collections. And I'm I'm a member of a couple of different libraries, a, a city library and a county library. And they both offer ebook loans through the OverDrive interface. And so I will check there. And um, Harris County does not allow recommendations, but Houston allows recommendations. So if you find a book there and they don't yet carry it in their ebook collection, you can recommend it. And if enough people recommend a book, they will get some copies. They'll, they'll, they'll get some, add, it they'll in, add yeah. some ebook copies. So yeah, my first cool. choice is always library ebook. Number one, is there a and library I, ebook? <laughs> and, I've, and I have joked to people, I, you know, I think the greatest, the greatest innovation that the internet brought to us is library ebooks because I can be in the bathtub and finish a book and check another book out of the library without even leaving the bathtub. <laughs> I mean, does it get any better than that? No, it does not. <laughs> so then, Great you know, then I would say second after library ebooks is library physical books. If you can get a paper book, that's that's my next choice. And they have it borrow it, so you don't own it, and it has to go back. Right, exactly, and it puts a little pressure on you to read it faster. Obviously, with the right. with the ebooks, e if it expires, you just put it back on your list, and it comes back around eventually. And then third, I would say is discount bookstores. You know, half half price books in Houston. Um, well, you're here, buying used here, books. 
here in Chattanooga, there's a, a great used bookstore called McKay's and um, everybody's got a used bookstore. Yeah. So there, you know, and, and my reasoning there is I, I spend a few bucks for it. I read it when I'm finished, I take it back and they give me 50 cents or something. Right. But you, you know. put it back in the, in, in the alternative library that is a used bookstore, right? right. Like that's exactly. what that is for. Yeah, and then only if those things are exhausted and I and I still desperately want to read the book, do I consider buying from Amazon. Eileen, who's with us in Zoom, pointed out that Amazon has a ton of digitized public domain classics. Oh, that's for cool. Free. There you go. So you, if you haven't joined the ebook revolution, you can start with downloading some classics from Amazon and see how you like it. Yeah, that's and a good idea. I, I know there are people who really prefer books on paper. They like having the physical thing to hold in their hands. And I sort of mm -hmm. understand that physical books still have a great deal of appeal, the tactile experience, but it's easier. E ebooks are a little easier on my eyes because I can make the type as large as I want. And there's, and they provide a lot of contrast. Yeah. Um, and it's, and, and you can have some physical books. I mean, we're not talking about you should have no physical books in your life. We're talking about you should curate the collection of physical books to something that you can manage. And it should be things that pass a whole bunch of criteria about why it needs to stay. And so as, as somebody who reads books, you know, I'm constantly churning through a book. You know, some of the stuff that I read for entertainment is not things that I'm not you know, I used to go to the bookstore and buy physical books back in the day before eBooks didn't exist. And, you know, I would end up with the 14 books in a series in hardback from the half price bookstore. <laughs> and, and, you know, then, then they're in the house and I've read them and I'm not going to circle back because I'm on to the next book already. And so I'm not somebody who goes back to all of my books and reads them again and again. And I know you've talked about that. There's a few books that you read that you like go back and read every year, but that's like a fraction of the amount right. of reading that you do. Right. And so, yeah. yes, you want to keep the ones that you, we've talked about that too. Like what makes it stay in the library? You um, have read it before, but you will read it again and not, you might read it again, but you do read it again. You like to return to it over and over again. And so that book you probably want to keep in your physical form in your library. The ones that you think of, a, you told me one time your um, uh, children's books that you think of as keepsakes. So there's some keepsake books right. that make sense to keep. And that's also a small fraction. And so there's going to be the ones that you love forever as keepsakes. And there's going to be the ones that you love the content enough to read over and over again. And the, all the rest are going to be one and done. And so if they're one and done, then the question is, why are you the keeper of the book? Why are you putting the book in dry dock, never to be taken out again? Um, it, it needs to be read. <laughs> and it, in order, if you've already read it, it needs to go on to the next person who can read it. And so donating it to the library, giving it to a, a used bookstore um, is a great way to put it in circulation. And I, I think people get really twitchy about selling it to the bookstore and not making a bunch of money and it's like they're already a used bookstore selling it for half of its original price of course they're going to offer you <laughs> a quarter of the price or they're they don't Less. they can't stay in business right yeah. so you're providing them inventory to resell so you don't want to think of it as i don't want to give it to the half price because i'm not going to make big money on it you're not you spent the money you paid for the entertainment that's what you get and so now it's time to go and donate it away to the half price people and get your, you know, $3 or $10 or $40. And, you know, you're going to turn around and spend that money in the store anyway. You're just going to buy more books. So it doesn't matter how much money you get. All you're really doing is you're having your experience with the book. And then when you've read it and you're ready to release it, then it can go back into the books, into a used bookstore and basically become the um, alternative library for the all of the other bookworms like you who are um, browsing like crazy looking for their next read. And so it's a perfect captured audience. It's a very targeted audience 
where your book goes in and it's likely to go back out because everybody else in that room is looking for books too. <laughs> so it's a perfect place to release them into the wild, I guess. <laughs> Eileen mentioned, um, since I, since I talked about Amazon, um, yes. you don't have to, um, you don't have to have a Kindle. I myself use an Apple iPad but my oh, main, there's a kin, yeah, there's a Kindle, there's a Kindle app, app on the iPad. And, and that's the main thing I use. I also use Apple's iBook. Is that what it's called? I think that's what it's Probably. called. App, Apple has an app specifically for eBooks in there, and they, Apple you Apple uses a different format. Not it's not the Kindle format. Right. I have several readers. The Gutenberg Project has its own reader that you can use to read some of the stuff that's been collected by the Gutenberg project in, right. in case anybody's not familiar with that. Well, if you, if you're a reader, you probably are, but the Gutenberg project is an open source project to put, to create digital versions of classic books that are in the public domain and, and may, some of them have gone out of print. Many of them have gone out of print. And so mm. they're sort of, they're scanning and, doing text recognition and then using volunteers to proofread to produce oh digi digital editions of, of a lot of books. That's cool. Ellie said, please talk about donating books. Many libraries no longer take for book sales, <laughs> selling books on, um, including online, giving away books to free pass along boxes, et cetera. Yes, um, uh, the donation landscape has changed a little bit, but um, the large libraries, I mean, Houston is a perfect example. There is a um, Friends of the Library group that is basically the, a nonprofit arm that supports library function, and they do fundraising for the library, and how they do that is that they have, have had book sales. So they have a warehouse, and when you donate to the library system here, those books get sent to the Friends of the Library warehouse. And so they sort them and catalog them and they have volunteers that go and put books online um, to sell them. And uh, they send things off to Better World Books and they have their own um, individual sales, although I don't know what how they're operating since the pandemic hit. But when they're normally operating, they have several vehicles, including online sales, to try to churn the books, make money off of them, and that money then gets donated back to the library for library programs. And so uh, I think all larger cities will probably have some donation function where they're either sending them and being processed in the library or being sent on to someone else that's supporting the library. Um, what was the other option that she wanted me to talk about? Uh, uh, oh, um, I saw the uh, somebody mentioned the little um, free library boxes that people are, have been popping up. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is there's lots of small libraries out there that are associated with schools. And if you think that your books are appropriate for children, not that they're children's books, but that they're not um, – they're not too racy or inappropriate for children that you can send those books on to um, local school libraries. Think about your high school, your middle school, your elementary school, all your little kids um, books <laughs> may be able to go to the library and be donated. Please don't show up with the books without making a phone call for us and make sure that they're okay with that. But yeah. And, and, and right now they're probably not accepting anything, but yeah, this, this eventually, will not this will not be forever, we hope. They'll go back, right? Um, um, Ellie, Ellie also said, please address special subject collections. I'm, I need I'm not, an example. Yeah, maybe Ellie can come back to us with a... Yeah, uh, give me an example yeah, of what you're asking me about there. What she's asking, but, I, well, it made me think of a Bob and his golf books. His golf collection, right? You know, he had a huge... We, we just talked about that, I think, last week, but he yeah, had... Yeah, in the collection... Video. hundreds or even i don't know even maybe a thousand golf books yeah yeah and gave it to his alma mater which wanted it he offered it to them and they wanted it and then you know they've cataloged they've cataloged it all and recognized his, his donation i'm sure there's a plaque 
somewhere with his name on it in right. the library where they keep it. Right. And and that was a, that was after a lifetime of collecting Gawk books on his travels. Then he gave the whole collection away when they downsized and moved into a smaller house. And um, so he got lucky that he got to give away the whole collection at once, partially because it was a curated collection that was all related. Um, that wouldn't apply to everyone, of course. But uh, you know, I didn't think about saying a university might, uh, a university library might want some donations as well. Um, but you also have to think about, you know, your average sort of entertainment reading uh, that is a paperback and it's a series and it's ongoing and it's just for fun, fun fiction. Um, those kinds of things would be really useful in a hospital, in a senior center, in a um, veterans center, any kind of a community center where seniors are gathering. You can call and find out. A, do they have books? B, do they want books? They often um, give them away. And so if you have any kind of a community gathering area in your, in your physical surrounds, um, it might be a good place to ask, hey, do you guys have a lending library? Do you give books away? Do you want any kind of particular books? Can I bring you some? And so Churches might have some. The kids' books could go into a, a church uh, where they're keeping a nursery or they're doing babysitting, um, any kind of daycare or school. Have we, mentioned, all... have we mentioned literacy programs? No, we have not mentioned literacy programs. I think li literacy programs would probably be a good place to donate books because they're looking to put, if they can get free books to put in the hands of people who are learning to read, that would probably then there you go right so i mean there's uh, there's lots of readers out there and the question is just how do you connect to them and um, you may have to do like all of our disbursement methods you're going to have to do some legwork to make some phone calls to find out who has a collection but don't be afraid to think small like it doesn't have to be a big public art uh, so here somebody said prison libraries there you go so there's all kinds of um small collections of books and people struggling to put books in those libraries. And so if you um, do a little digging, you can find some place to relocate some of it. And maybe it can all, you know, because your topics are varied and, and very wide, you may not be able to take them all to one place. You may need to take certain types of books. Here's all the romance novels. You probably can't take the romance novels to an elementary school, but <laughs> you might be able to take those to a hospital or to a vet organization or a senior center, um, uh, any kind of um, assisted living place or independent living place might have a library in it. And so there's going to be plenty of places for you to go. You just have to make some phone calls to see who's taken right now. Great comment from Deborah. She said, one birthday I asked my party guests, to each bring a secondhand book that they believed everyone should read at least once in her life. After I read them all, I uh, freed them up to the donation pile. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. What a lovely, th like here, I will help you declutter. Bring me a used book. <laughs> well, and it's, a, it's also just a great way to connect with other people who share your Yeah, interests. to find out what, uh, the, what people are interested in reading, right? I always feel like it sort of deepens the relationship when I find out you know, I, somebody else loves a book that I loved. Right. It's true. And then Karen on Facebook asked, what did Ed do with his books? Ed, and what did you do with your books? Well, the first thing I did, as you probably remember, <laughs> is I had a whole lot of friends come over to the house and I had kind of gone through and picked out what I, what I knew. Was what couldn't leave. Me, what I was yeah. absolutely keeping. And I, and and boxed it up and then i let my friends go wild on everything else and handed them paper you know paper grocery you know brown paper grocery bags and said please take as many as you like and Be that happy. probably go shopping that probably took care of 80 percent wouldn't you say yeah i mean it was a it was a huge chunk of it out the door that way and then but I how many people do you think came at least 15 yeah, over so the course of several weeks. You told bookworms there was free books, and so right. then they went away. <laughs> yes. And then I think we took 
somewhere between 15 and 20 boxes to half price, price books and got a pittance for them. Right, got nothing, <laughs> but that was the whole point, right? Yeah. It has to not be about the about the money you get for them. I think books are an area where I mean we say this we say this about all sorts of um, clutter that we target for donation, but it helps if you think about the value that your thing might have for someone else. It can make it yes. easier to let go, and I think that's more true of books than tchotchkes or used clothing or things that have exhausted their usefulness to you right books, books are infinitely and permanently useful <laughs> and, and, well and consumable like yes you can read it and get a hundred percent of the benefit out of it and the next and person can have the can same too. experience right. yeah like it doesn't wear out until you you know drop it in the water or something <laughs> it's like you know you can pass it along and everybody gets the same amount of enjoyment from the book and so it's totally worth it i'm going to pause here because I, I got this saw this thing on facebook just this morning and it made me laugh so hard so there are names for people who read a lot, and in in English, the term is a bookworm, and we've said that a couple of times. In Indonesia, the term is book flea. In Romanian, the book the term is a library mouse. In German, it is read rat, which I nice. thought was good, read rat. In French, it's ink drinker, which, I, of course, the French term would be associated with drinking, right? <clears throat> the Danish version is reading horse. So <laughs> I thought that was really clever. Bookworm, book flea, library mouse, read rat, ink drinker, and reading horse are alternatives to being a bookworm. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that made me laugh. Linda on Facebook asked, what about books and textbooks from undergraduate and graduate days? I finished my studies in 2011 and have many books I no longer want and may be outdated. And sad to say, they, those are often, they have often sort of lost their value because professors, they become dated. yeah, and professors want to teach from a particular edition so that every, when they refer to page 283, everybody's, you know, to page 283 is the same. And yeah, they can get especially, them well, and especially, the same place. You know, text, especially textbooks, mm -hmm. they want a particular edition well, and, the, you know, a science textbook, you know, a certain amount of the science is is stable and stays the same, but there's always, you know, 20 or 30 percent of it that it's been evolving over time. And so the textbook, medical textbooks, for instance, come to mind. A medical textbook that's 20 years old, you can't rely on it anymore beyond a certain basic understanding of anatomy. And the, some, the treatment methods are all so different now. And so that is a constantly evolving um, discipline that requires an ever more refreshed version of book. And so there are some textbooks that just don't work. Unless you can bring yourself to recycle them, I mean, to sell them immediately, you know, within a couple of years, two or three years of having been in school, um, so that there's a possibility that that textbook is still in use in your area and uh, some uh, somebody might get some good use out of it but if you hold on to the textbook for 20 years and then try to sell it it's not going to be in use likely anywhere and so it's not going to be useful as a used book at that point to another student coming behind you so a i would say whenever you get a textbook get rid of it quickly because that's the only way that somebody another student will likely be able to get good use out of that used textbook right if it gets turned around immediately and if it's a 20 year old textbook if you've held on to them since you were in college three decades ago then you have to bless it and kiss it and send it to book recycling so you can donate those to the library or whatever but they will shunt them off for recycling because they're not going to be super useful um some of them that uh if you think of them as crafts materials some of those books, uh, like um, I was just at a client yesterday, uh, Miss Margaret will probably not mind that I'm calling her out. She had a <laughs> medical textbook. She had a medical dictionary reference book that she used all during her career. And so the book is probably at least 30 or 40 years old, maybe not that long, but it, it, she had it for a long time. So 
it when she's been retired for a long time and it's probably not the most up-to-date book and so for her what's interesting about it is that the dictionary and the medical terminology and the medical illustrations make it interesting for junk journals and um, paper crafts so she cuts papers out of it to use in her crafts so there are some <clears throat> some amounts of textbooks that might make for interesting craft supplies but it's not a bulk solution no crafter can use up all of the pages in a book in a hurry so and it's and there's some um some book lovers have an aversion to the book being destroyed in that way so unless you are comfortable with that you know, you may have to just let those books go off to someplace who is and let someone else recycle them on your behalf. So it's taking them to the used bookstore or just putting them into the library system as a donation means that they will be properly recycled uh, because they all have that function of, you know, they get the borrowed book back and the book has been destroyed by a little kid or an animal chewed it up or whatever and they can't lend it out anymore um, and they can't resell it or give it for a book sale and so they have a functionality to recycle books that are no longer lendable and so you can sort of pass that evaluation chore along to someone else right so give them away to somebody else and let somebody else figure out how to recycle them that's the bottom line um uh, are with you, those textbooks are you looking at facebook comments or did you just no, have no, to, no. oh well because Mar because no. margaret actually beat you to the punch on that one oh she said, did <laughs> <laughs> old, old textbooks are good for collage and junk jour journalers right. and and Cheryl um, also echoed that said textbooks with illustrations and words and tough covers are a gold mine for collage multimedia and junk journal artists but but think about it you know if you had in a collection of textbook and maybe you have 20 textbooks like 20 textbooks is a lifetime supply for a book crafter yeah that's a lot of pages a lot of like they're going to take 20 pages out of this book and then there's going to be the other 250 pages left so it unless they use the actual whole thing and make but it's not a it's not a high volume turnaround it's not a high volume solution you can't take a whole library and give it to a crafter and expect them to execute craft projects out of all those books so you can get a couple of really cool ones away to a crafter but they cannot accept your library as source material. <laughs> Let me right. just head that off of the pass. <laughs> they can take two books or three books away from you, but they can't take 30 in or the 50 craft, in the craft or 2,500. In the craft realm, Leela had another uh, cool suggestion. She said her daughter used to love to take old books that were no longer useful and create uh, a, a certain type of poem. They're called blackout poems. You take a book and you black out all the words except the ones you want to leave as part of your poem. Oh, so that's you end interesting. up. Well, and I'll show you. A, I'll show you a. Uh, here's what blackout poems look like. Oh, there you go. Look at that. So wow. you, t you know, you 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 find the words on the page that you want to keep, <laughs> and and black out everything else. And then you're coloring like crazy. Yeah. Isn't that yeah, crazy? that's a very crafty thing, isn't it? So, I, I mean, it, the bottom line is there is a craft component to books that cannot be used some other way. And it's just not a high volume one, but it is a very specific, you know, it, there's all kinds of ways that that those pages become backdrops or the physical book becomes a uh, uh, sort of a, base material for more craft and art and so it it's one way to get rid of them but if you have a huge volume uh, you can't expect one crafter to take it all okay we're running out of time and oh, eileen sure enough. eileen mentioned that we haven't even gotten to magazines or catalogs oh magazines or catalogs so magazines and catalogs are a big recycling issue and it is let me talk about catalogs first. So here's the thing about catalogs. They keep sending them because it works, right? Like people like to flip the catalog and they like to shop with the physical paper and look at the pieces of paper. It's not the same experience as shopping online. It's a very different thing to go through their curated pictures of what's cool and decide what you're going to buy. So 
they keep sending them even though you can't imagine why because you throw so many out but they keep sending them and it's because it works as an advertising method and a buying method it triggers you to buy once you've bought a catalog once you bought something from a catalog they put you on the you know hot prospect list right i'm making the term up but the idea is once you have bought something from them you are a targeted customer so they will point the fire hose of catalogs at your house and they will start blowing them towards you and it will be endless and so you buy one and then you get the package and inside the package is two more catalogs right and then they mail you some in the mail and then you order something else and then you get two more catalogs and so it's an endless stream and depending on the company they will issue over and over and over again maybe you get one every week maybe you get one every day maybe you give it's it's unbelievable how fast they come and what you will see is that here's the basic inventory and next week the inventory has shifted here. So it's like a Venn diagram where 80% of what was in the first catalog is in the second catalog and they've sold some stuff. And so some of it's gone off and they've got some new things coming on. And so they've added some new on, but it's like this moving target that from catalog to catalog has basically the same stuff in it plus or minus at each end. So they just keep sending you, pictures of the same stuff over and over again because they know it makes you buy it. So the idea that you have to look at every catalog because you might miss something is a fallacy and a moot point. If you, the most current catalog is what you get and the catalog that came out last week, there's no guarantee that 100% of that stuff is there. It's only still available to buy if it's in the new catalog. So anytime you get a new catalog, you can immediately throw out all the other catalogs. And in high traffic times, like at Christmas time, even companies that don't send many catalogs ramp up catalog production at, at the holiday season when everybody's shopping. And so you're going to get one a week or one every couple of days, and here comes the next one from the same company. The target isn't really moving, <laughs> but as people are shopping, they're running out of stuff, right? And so even in that peak time you only need to keep the most recent catalog and once it's gone once you haven't shopped out of it for a week it's probably already out of date some of the stuff's still going to be there but not all of it and so don't be surprised if you pick up a catalog that's two weeks old and you try to buy something and they're like oh that's out of stock like yeah it's not the most current catalog so catalogs keep the most recent recycle the rest 100 percent. get it out of there don't even think about it and don't tell yourself, I need to look at the back issues because you know, you don't because it's all, <laughs> if it's still there, it's in the new catalog. That's what I'm saying. So that's one catalogs, poof. Magazines are a whole different ball of wax, right? Because magazines are a form of writing and they're writing, depending on what the magazine's about, you know, Newsweek is a nonstop, ever moving target of the current news. So if you go back and read a Newsweek that's six months old, you are six months out of date of the current news situation. But it, you know, the, the Vogue magazine that is six months old, all that's really out of date in there is that the fashions aren't current anymore. But craft magazines, if you get a magazine that is a serial craft magazine, the instructions to do that craft are ever renewable. It doesn't matter that the craft magazine is five years old. You can still go in and do the craft as they outlined it. And so those magazines become another source of information and data. And you have to evaluate how important and dated the data is. If it's a People magazine, for instance, constantly new information, constantly here's the latest celebrity, here's the newest you know, fill in the blank. <laughs> it's a it's a constantly churning what's popular and what's of the moment and what scandal just broke and that kind of stuff. So that information gets slowly um, evaluated, it changed over time. And it's the old People magazine isn't as much fun when it's six months old as when it is the current week. But there's going to be others that Scientific American, for instance, that's a cool magazine. It has cool stuff in it. And mostly the, uh, the things that they write about are 
not they're dating in a much more slow way i guess is the way to say it some of the stuff that they put in is always going to be current some of the stuff they put in it's slowly evolving the science is slowly evolving over time and so it might get a little out of date but you have to decide if you want to manage data in magazine form and what makes it hard about magazines is that they're floppy <laughs> They don't stand up well and they don't stack on the bookshelf like a book does and it, even a paperback book stacks better and stores better than a magazine and so um, managing magazines becomes people who cook and buy cooking magazines those magazines you can always go in and make that recipe right and so they don't age out other than um, if you have a magazine from the 60s that has jello mold in recipes in it you may not want to go back to that one you have to decide if the magazine that you're collecting if you are somebody who goes back and looks at magazines again first of all um, if the ones that are sort of uh, ever fresh the craft magazine a cooking magazine a science magazine if those are always the data is mostly always good and the question is whether you're a person who returns to them for ideas or returns to them to reread even if the magazine was super super fascinating when you read it and the stuff that you read in it was fabulous if it's not something that you will go back and read again you have to consider that you paid for the magazine and you read the magazine and now it is like you've consumed it as if you've eaten food if you've read through the magazine and then you can like pass it along if you don't want to recycle it you can go through the same exercise of it can go to a senior center it can go to a vets it can go to a library it can go to a school you can send those that reading material on to let somebody else consume it because if it's going to just become parked in the backwater that is your house and you're not going to go in and read them all again then all you're really doing is keeping that reading material from somebody else and so you might as well find a way to happily and comfortably send it on to the next person. Okay, we People are. Are we out of time? We are way I'll out of time. Talking about, okay, I'll stop um, talking about magazines. A couple more quick things. Nancy <laughs> said, I have all of the Dr. Phil magazines published and all of Organization magazine. Do you think they'll be of some value sometime? I hate to just toss them. And well, I you don't have to toss them, but you, those are ones that you could absolutely go and give away to. Donate, yeah. Donate away to, to, so that there's an audience that could read them again. Used bookstores will take magazines. I don't know if they give you anything much for magazines. Yeah. Money, if they give you anything yeah. at all, it's, it's a, a pittance. Um, and then one more question was um, Karen on Facebook asked um, what was the name of the software I mentioned. And the overdrive overdrive.com oh. is a di is a digital content distribution resource and the way it works is they they have deals with 50,000 libraries and schools in in about 78 countries and so you you can go to overdrive.com and look to see if your library is there first of all but libraries buy a certain number of copies of an ebook from overdrive and so you know houston public library might have 15 licenses for a, any particular you know, book a, a best-selling book you know a current bestseller and overdrive also offers they do a thing where you know there will be a book that they're encouraging everyone to read and they'll make you know a huge number of licenses licenses of it available and then the way it works is, so you, you put in your library card number, which gives you the rights to borrow books that your library has agreed to make available. And then Overdrive uses the Amazon.com interface to deliver the eBooks to you. You know, it doesn't cost anything and Amazon doesn't make any money off of it. You just um, I mean, they, Amazon probably makes some money off of it, but you don't pay them. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but you, uh, you, you go through Amazon, you know, Overdrive takes you to, to Amazon.com to actually check out the book. And then it downloads it to your device. It's really 
truly amazing. And isn't it like time triggered? So it's it disappears from your device after right. two weeks or three right. weeks or something. So your your library will give you. Uh, I think it's typically two weeks, and um, to and get then it, yeah, then it just disappears off of your device. And yeah. Um, if it if no one else has borrowed it, you can typically that's how they lend it. <laughs> you can typically renew it if if there's still a license available when it expires. A um, popular book is gonna it's gonna be there's gonna be a queue for the licenses, so you may have to get in line and wait your turn again. I'm gonna go. We're gonna go super quick on announcements. In fact, I'm gonna go unconventional announcements and only announce the things that we don't announce every week. Okay. One of them is to remind people that you can hire Gail. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the Houston area, you can hire Gail to come to your house. And um, right? if you are not in the Houston area, you can still hire Gail for virtual organizing. Hold up the sign for that one. Okay. All right. You say that. We haven't talked about that in a while. Go to cfhou.com slash virtual to find out more about booking a virtual organizing session with Gail. I also want to remind people that we are using Patreon to raise a few bucks to support our efforts to make more and cost. videos and a book one of these days. And so go to cfhou.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We don't have a sign for that that Gail can flash on the screen. As usual, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, etc., and at our website, clutterfairyhouston.com. Ta-da! Okay. Thanks, you guys. I'm sorry that we ran over. I was, uh, you know, waxing poetic about magazines, and I lost track of time. My apologies, and we will do better next week, and we love that you come and join us. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.